Good afternoon, everyone. Can I have your attention, please? Uh, please continue uh, with your salad, but our intention is to uh, begin the program and have our keynote speaker uh, before we serve the uh, main lunch. But I'd like to ask uh, Reverend Clarence Bullock to do the invocation. Thank you, Commissioner. If you look at the agenda of the, this conference, you'll find that there were five service areas that were very extensive in its uh, undertaking with moderators at each and every one of them. I have taken the privilege to pray for each one of those areas individually. So therefore, I will not do that as a group today as a part of this conference. But I want to encourage every person to know that we are praying because of the agenda for the conference is aggressive, extremely aggressive. And in order to do that, we ask the help of the Almighty God to achieve those things as we serve people. Let us pray. God of all creation, we come before you today to honor you, to give you thanks. You are the source of all goodness. You are the source of all blessing. Thank you for your gifts and this opportunity to serve people. In the scripture, almighty God, you promised to help us in our time of need. Today, Lord God, we call upon your help to fulfill these mandates that is given unto us. We ask you, number one, to guide us, to direct us at this conference, to grant unto us wisdom, productive ideas, and respect for one another. We ask you to grant unto us understanding on how to do more with less. We ask you to give us knowledge and skills to build affordable, sustainable housing for all. We ask that you to help us to develop vibrant communities that are great places to live, to work, to worship. We ask you, dear God, to bless our sponsors of this conference who demonstrate their support to community residents by supporting this conference. And we ask all of this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Bullock. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this year's conference. I hope that the morning sessions have introduced you to new ideas and new people and new avenues of collaboration. And if instead you were making contacts and exchanging cards, I should mention that there's a networking conference this evening at 5.30, out the doors and to your left. I'd also like to thank our sponsors whose support and assistance made this event possible. The New Jersey Housing Mortgage Finance Agency, New Jersey Economic Development Agency Authority, and the New Jersey Affordable Housing Management Association. I am pleased to say that the staffs at DCA, at HMFA, at EDA, at the Department of Human Services, at the Department of Children and Family are all working together to make this a better state for more people to find affordable housing, to find housing that is supportive, find housing that's in neighborhoods that are safe, and find housing where jobs and children and communities can flourish. Many of you today tend to the needs of those who require more assistance than a college loan to thrive. Many of you know firsthand how essential it is for a community to accept and support diverse populations with varied desires and needs. This administration has undertaken to strengthen those support services and systems to assist the most vulnerable 
and those fragile among our communities, and to help us create housing and job opportunities. You know, it's often at these events that I feel somewhat embarrassed that I'm a government bureaucrat who provides the funding to build housing, but I don't day to day have to provide the support and meet with the community and deal with individuals who are suffering and often have no one to turn to but you for support. And so I applaud you for what you do day to day, hour by hour, week by week. Thank you so very much. If you'll indulge me just briefly, I'd like to talk about some of the things we've undertaken in these past six months, which I repeatedly tell my staff feels like the past six years. We are going to finance this year some 5,000 units of affordable housing with our sister agency, the, the uh, Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency. And many of those units are going to be devoted to people with special needs. We've taken 300 state rental assistance vouchers and dedicated them to communities where low levels of poverty exist. It is essential in this state and in this society for us to move people away from areas of concentrated poverty to areas where they can flourish. And, and many of those units, many of those units will be for our special needs community. We've started to review the applications, and I pledge to you, we will spend, pay special attention to those with special needs. We have a new initiative in this administration to deal with people who are exiting the prisons, particularly individuals who are in county prisons and those maxing out from the state prison system. These are individuals with no governmental support services behind them. And so we've allocated $5 million this year to provide pilots in six counties where staff is going to go into the prisons before people are released and discuss with them what their needs are and what avenues of support are available. It's absolutely essential that we do that. It's absolutely we set, set, do that for this most frail community. 15 to 30 percent of the people being released by our prisons have mental illness issues. We need to do that, and we're pledged to do that over a multi-year program. An activity near and dear to me, and those of you who were in the homeless seminar heard about it. In the city of Camden, 1% of the users of the emergency rooms account for 30% of the costs of providing medical services. So we are committed, we've committed 50, 50 vouchers to establish a homeless first model and $350,000 of state revenues to begin the service component. We will expand that program as soon as we prove that that program works. It will save money and it will save lives, and we're intent on doing that. Our keynote speaker will speak to this much more eloquently than I ever could. So let me introduce him. We learned of Mr. Early from Deb DeSantis, the president and CEO of the Corporation for Supportive Housing. I've known and worked with Deb for many years through many administrations. And when she makes a recommendation, I not only take it seriously, but we certainly act upon it. 
And not surprisingly, it was a great suggestion. Not only is Mr. Early a New York Times bestseller, but a Pulitzer Prize finalist. He is a man who has firsthand seen what happens when a system meant to prov provide help breaks down, in this case, when trying to find help for his son who was struggling with mental illness. Looking for solutions, Mr. Early instead encountered one of those revolving door situations. We all dread, we all work hard to fight. This is the story of his book, Crazy, a word not to describe his son, but to describe the system he found. As we listen to Mr. Early's story, we will see our actions to provide lasting solutions are so vital to those we serve. And now it is my pleasure, pleasure please join me in giving a warm welcome to Peter Early. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Hello. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. You know, uh, my father was born in Clayton, New Jersey, in a house my grandfather built. And although I grew up in Oklahoma, we vacationed in Sea Isle City every year. And I married a woman from Cherry Hill, so I have a certain uh, affinity with your state. I've come today as a journalist, I've come as an author, but I've really come as a father to tell you my story. And my story begins with a frantic car ride and my son saying these words, Dad, how would you feel? if someone you love killed himself. When I would picked up my son, Kevin, in New York City in Manhattan where he was going to school, he'd been wandering around for five days. He hadn't slept. He was convinced God had him on a special secret mission. And during that frantic car ride from Manhattan to Fairfax County, Virginia, where I live outside Washington, D.C., he would laugh one minute and then he'd begin sobbing the next. And I pleaded with him to take his medication because he'd been diagnosed a year earlier with a mental illness but had stopped taking his pills. I pleaded with him and he screamed at me, pills are poison, leave me alone. And we got to the emergency room in Fairfax County, Virginia, and the nurse rolled her eyes while Kevin talked gibberish about how God had him on this special mission. And then we were taken into a room where we were sitting all by ourselves away from everyone else because he was acting so strangely. And after four hours, my son said, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm going to leave. I said, hang on, hang on. And I raced outside and I literally grabbed a doctor. And I will never forget how he came in that room. He came in with his hands up as if he was surrendering. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Early. I really can't help your son. I said, you haven't even examined him. And he said it didn't matter. Law in Virginia was very clear at that point. Unless a person posed an imminent, immediate danger. They couldn't be required to take medication. The nurse had told him that my son thought all pills were poison. And we'd been sitting there for four hours, so obviously there was nothing wrong. There was no danger. So he looked at me and he said, you know, you seem like a nice guy, a concerned father. You bring him back after he tries to kill you or tries to kill someone else. Well, I took my son home and I watched him sink deeper and deeper in a mental abyss. At one point, he had tin foil wrapped around his head as watching TV because he thought that the CIA was reading his thoughts. He slipped out of my house. He slipped out early in the morning. He broke into a stranger's house. Luckily, no one was there. He broke in to take a bubble bath. It took five police officers and an attack dog to get him out. And when they did, they took him to a community treatment center and they called me and I raced over and a policeman was standing outside and he said, wait, 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 Mr. Early. Even though your son has told us he's been diagnosed with a mental illness, bipolar disorder, even though we picked him up in a house where he's taking a bubble, even though he told us that he's off his medication, unless you go in and you tell that doctor that your son has threatened to kill you, he will not meet Virginia's imminent danger criteria and will take him to jail and you don't want that. And I looked at him and I said, well, my son hasn't threatened to kill me. And he shrugged and he walked away. So I'm here to tell you I do it with no great pride because it really hurt my relationship with my son. I lied. I went and I said, my son's threatened to kill me. And that was good enough to get him taken to a hospital rather than jail where he voluntarily committed himself. But our problems were far from over. 24 hours after my son voluntarily committed himself to that hospital, I got a call from his doctor. Mr. Early, I'm sorry, we're going to have to discharge your son. The insurance company is not going to pay. They say he's not a danger. He can be released. Well, I called that insurance company. And I got absolutely nowhere 
until I happened to mention that I used to work at the Washington Post. And I happened to mention that I was friends of Mike Wallace with 60 Minutes and they should expect a call. Now, can you imagine getting that? Hi, this is Mike Wallace with 60 Minutes. Why is Pete Early's son? All of a sudden, my son was allowed to stay in that hospital for a record-breaking 14 days. And the short time between me picking up my son in Manhattan and his admission to that hospital, I had lied to get him into treatment. I had violated my ethics because you're not supposed to bully people if you're a reporter. And just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, they did. My son was charged with two felonies, breaking and entering and destruction of property. I, I just feel so helpless, I told my wife, Patty, one night. I want to help our son. I don't know how to do it. And she looked at me and she said, well, why don't you do what you do best then? Pete Early, a father, can't do much. But Pete Early, a journalist, can. Why don't you investigate this and see what's going on in our mental health community? Well, for once, I listened to my wife. Now, that's my only joke, folks. If you don't get that, you're in trouble, all right? I did a little digging. And I discovered what happened to my son. It was no aberration. Right now, as we're sitting in this beautiful casino, there are 365,000 people with schizophrenia, persistent depression, and bipolar disorder in our jails and prisons. More than 2 million go through the criminal justice system every year. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, 40% of persons with serious mental illness will have a serious encounter with law enforcement. 49% of all police shootings involve persons with mental illness. This population stays in jails four to eight times longer than others charged with the same crimes. It is uh, costs seven times more to incarcerate and has a recidivism rate 15% higher than anyone else. 85% of persons with mental illness who are in jails and prisons return within the first five years. And I've heard, I know you've heard this before, the largest public mental facility in the United States today is not a treatment center, it's the LA County Jail. Well, those statistics gave me an idea. Why are we talking about mental health and homelessness and housing. I'm so thrilled to be here because 40% of our nation's homeless population is thought to have mental health and substance abuse issues, and more than 70% of the persons in jails and prisons have those issues. Well, I decided I'd use these statistics and do what my wife told me, but first I talked to my son. I said, Kevin, I'm thinking about writing a book about you. And he looked at me and he said, well, Dad, nobody's going to want to read that. And I said, no, I'm going to find a jail or prison somewhere far away from Fairfax County because I don't want to irritate a judge or a prosecutor. And I'll go in that jail, and I'll find people with mental illness, and I'll follow them through the system. And then I'll come back, and I'll talk to all the experts and the correctional officers and the judges and try to make sense of it. And he said, Dad, if it helps someone else, tell my story. Well, I started at the L.A. County Jail. Made sense. Largest public mental facility. It lasted two days before they threw me out, saying I was violating HIPAA. The truth was they just didn't want me to see what was happening in that jail. I tried Chicago next. They said no. Rikers Island next. They said no. Baltimore next. They said no. I tried my hometown of Washington, D.C., and they literally said, hell no. And I ended up going to Miami because of a forward-thinking judge who said, I want you to see what's going on in our jail here. You come down here. I'm going to take you in that jail briefly, Sea Wing. There are 1,200 persons average with mental illness in that jail. C wing is the suicide wing. There are 19 cells in the cell block. It's a U-shaped cell block. All the officers walk up and down the center. The cells have plexiglass fronts. And because of a design flaw, the cold air blew in but stayed in those cells. But there were no blankets. And when I looked in those cells, I saw cells built for two people with five and six people in them, completely naked. And because the cells were old, the water system often broke down, medications made you thirsty, so you saw people drinking out of toilets. And when you heard the normal jail sounds, but when you listened closer, you could hear the asylum sounds, people screaming at unseen tormentors. And then I heard a thud, 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 then faster, thud, 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 then louder, thud, thud, thud. It was one of the inmates running forward, smashing his forehead in the front of the glass, splitting it open. I ain't crazy, he screamed then quit acting like you are an unconcerned officer called back. Now, I got to know the officers who worked on this floor, and I discovered they called it the forgotten floor. 
And I thought, oh, they're talking about the people who are inmates. No, they were also talking about themselves. Not one of these officers had ever received any kind of training to work with persons with mental illness. And when I got to know them better, every one of the officers told me they were troublesome employees. Their bosses wanted to get rid of them, so they assigned them to work with the crazies and hoped that they'd quit and leave. My tour guide was Dr. Joseph Poitier, a fabulous doctor, an impossible job. A lot of people think, you get arrested, you'll get help. We're a jail. We don't help people here. I went with him on his morning rounds. On that one unit, there were 92 inmates. His rounds took us, I get this right, 19 minutes. We spent 12.7 seconds talking to every inmate. 12.7 seconds. I want to tell you about one of them, Alison Collier, classic case, schizophrenia, kind of person who used to be locked up in state institutions. Now she's back in the community. But let's look at where she lived. She lived in a cardboard box behind a restaurant. And this time she got arrested because she was walking down the street and her eyes locked with an elderly woman waiting for a bus. And Alice Ann screamed, stop stealing my thoughts. And she raced over and she shoved the older woman, not hard enough to knock her over, but she shoved her and went running off. And well-meaning witnesses came up and said, get her arrested, get her off the street. You get her arrested, she'll get help. Well, help is not what Alice Ann Collier got. Florida is an unusual state because so many people retire there. You can charge any crime that's committed against someone who's elderly as a felony. And because Alice Ann Collier had pushed two other people at bus stops, she was charged under that state's three strikes law, which meant she faced a mandatory, non-negotiable five years in prison. But when she was brought before the judge, he said, I can't put you on trial. You're not competent. You go to the state hospital in Chattahoochee to be made competent, not treated, made competent, and there's a difference. Treatment means you get help. That's not what she got. Every day she was taken into a room. She was shown three chairs. On one chair was written judge, another one prosecutor, a third one defense attorney. And when Alice Ann Collier could tell her keepers who sat in what chair, she was deemed competent enough to be put on trial. Well, as she returned to the jail, she came before the judge. He said, what's going on here? I sent you off to be made competent. You're not. You go back to Chattahoochee and you get made competent. When I discovered Alice Ann Collier in that jail, she'd been traveling between it and Chattahoochee 1,151 days, more than three years, and she'd never been put on trial. Now I'm a reporter. I got my little pen and paper, and I went running over the prosecutor. Look what I found. Look what I found. And they told me with absolutely no embarrassment. They knew exactly what they were doing with Alice Ann Collier. In fact, they planned to keep her for five years, which was the statutory maximum they could keep her without ever putting her on trial. Why? Because medication didn't seem to help her. She was dangerous. And there was no safe place, no housing, no treatment programs that she was eligible for in the entire state of Florida. Now, Alice Ann Collier was typical of the kind of people I was dealing with. These weren't Hannibal Lecter serial people, killers. There were people who were sick with mental illnesses. Let me tell you about April Hernandez, same age as my son. I got to know her in jail because the correctional officer said, oh, you should go interview her. She was framed. Who framed April Hernandez? Her own parents. They conspired with relatives to get her arrested for stealing a car. Why? Because she was homeless, she was psychotic, she was living on the streets of South Beach where she had been gang raped twice and attacked three times by teenagers who thought it was hilarious to beat up homeless people on a weekend. And the thing that was interesting about her was that she had started using drugs when she was 14 and everybody thought, oh, that's why she acts this way. And it was only after she was correctly diagnosed as having co-occurring problems did we realize that she had both a mental illness and a substance abuse problems. And nearly half of persons with mental illnesses have co-occurring problems. And 70% of persons in our jails and prisons have both co-occurring problems. Last person I want to talk to you about, Freddie Gilbert. I don't care if you live in beautiful New Jersey or you live in Washington, D.C., you know a Freddie Gilbert. A Miami study found that in a population of 2 million at any given time, there were 1,700 people who were sleeping in the cars or on the, they're homeless. But that same study found of those 1,700 people, almost all of them were able to move through our system into some kind of supportive housing, except, except for 507 individuals. They are always homeless. They are the chronic homeless. And every one of those 507 in Miami had a mental illness. Every one of those 507 in Miami had been arrested at least two or three times. 
Freddie Gilbert, when I met him in jail, was so sick. He could not speak. He stood naked in his cell. He grunted like an animal, and the officers controlled him by giving him sandwiches as if he were a dog performing for treats. And when I checked his record, I discovered in one year alone he'd been in that jail 14 times, but he'd been charged with misdemeanors, so there was nothing I could do but turn him out back on the streets. After my book was published, the University of Southern Florida's Mental Health Institute followed 97 frequent users, 97 over a five-year period. Listen to these statistics. These 97 individuals were arrested 2,200 times. They spent 27,000 days in jail, 13,000 days in crisis stabilization units, they cost the community $13 million with absolutely no reduction in recidivism or recovery. How in the world did we get in this mess? Well, if you're a student of history, you know we've come full circle back in colonial days. If you had a mental illness, you depended on your family, you were locked in jail, or you were warned out, which means the sheriff took you to the county line and said, start work walking and never come back here. In 1843, Dorothea Dix was teaching a Bible class in a Boston jail, and she's going through the jail, and she realizes there's a cell block that has no heat, and it's freezing. The people are literally freezing, and she goes to the jailer. She says, you can't treat people like this. Those people are freezing. And the jailer says, oh, no, 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 you don't understand, Miss Dix. Those people are lunatics. They don't feel the cold like us. Well, she spent the next two decades teaching that people needed treatment, not punishment for mental illness, and she personally persuaded 33 states to open up hospitals to help people. Well, we all know what happened next. During the next 50 years, these hospitals, many of them turned into giant warehouses where people were locked up and forgotten. In my native state of Oklahoma in the 1960s, and some of us remember the 1960s, a newspaper reporter did an investigation, and he said the state hospitals in Oklahoma in the 1960s were worse, I just said worse, than Nazi concentration camps. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy heard the cries for reform. He called on Congress to begin passing a community-based treatment program, $3 billion to replace the state hospitals, opening up 2,000 mental health treatments. The discovery of a new drug called Thorazine seemed to make it possible to move people off these locked wards into community settings. Well, what happened? Kennedy was assassinated. The Vietnam War escalated. Congress got ensnarled on Watergate. Thorazine turned out not to be so wonderful. And we developed a new acronym in America. N-I-M-B-Y, not in my backyard. In short, that $3 billion never got spent as planned. Those 2,000 centers never got opened as planned. And next came deinstitutionalization, the emptying of these dreaded state hospitals, a fabulous idea that turned into a cruel joke. I thought, I'd seen one floor of the cuckoo's nest, I thought we closed down state hospitals because of compassion and concern. But if you check your history books, you'll find out it wasn't compassion, it wasn't concern, it was money. State legislators were being pushed in a corner. They were getting sued. Civil rights lawyers were suing them. Newspapers doing exposés. State legislators going, oh my God, what are we gonna, we're going to have to spend millions to fix these places up. And then Uncle Sam came running in and said, no, 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 no. We'll take care of persons with mental illness. We'll provide them with housing and Medi Medicaid. And we'll take care of them, but not if they're in those state hospitals. And overnight, people were shoved out into our streets without any kind of community services. Well, what happened? The federal government did just as poor a job as states had about trying to take care of our folks. Well, it's been five decades since deinstitutionalization. So why are our jails filling up with people whose major crime is they got sick? Because despite millions of dollars, we still don't have decent community services in most of our towns and cities. Let's return to Miami. Not everybody there with a the mental illness is locked up in jail and prison. When I did my research, there were 4,500 people with serious mental illnesses who would have been institutionalized who are now living in that community. 4,500. Fabulous. They live in 650 boarding homes, assisted living facilities. Let's look at those 650 boarding homes. Of those 650 boarding homes, 450 can't pass the minimum standards to operate as a boarding home. What that means is if you tried to put anybody but someone with a mental illness in that home, it would be against the law. One of the ones I visited had a hole in the roof 
Rain was pouring through. Medications were scattered on a kitchen table. There was no therapy. The caretaker only spoke Spanish. None of the tenants spoke Spanish. Meals were rice and beans. There was no case managers. There was nothing but smoking cigarettes and watching TV. And I'd argue in this case, we haven't improved these people's lives. We're just hiding them better. Well, it's easy to pick on the owners of these slum projects, so let's dig a little deeper. When I did my research, the owners of an AL assisted living facility got $29.90 per day to take care of all the needs of one of those tenants, everything, $29.90. Well, you can tell I live in Washington, D.C. area because I put my dog in the Dulles